Welcome to the Workers' Reading Room. Today I'm continuing with American Trade Unionism, written by William Z. Foster. This is Chapter 5, The Trade Union Educational League. The loss of the 1919 steel strike upset my whole strategy. Gone was the plan for using this struggle as a springboard for beginning a general organizing campaign in all industries, and gone also was my hope of overthrowing the Gompers machine by the mass organization of the unorganized. But from our experience in the meatpacking and steel campaigns, two important lessons, aside from the major lessons of the great need for industrial unionism, etc., stood out sharp and clear for us as militants, and we proceeded to act upon them. The first was that our policy of working within the conservative unions was fundamentally correct. A mere handful of militants had been instrumental in launching and leading movements that had organized over half a million workers, native and foreign-born, Negroes and whites, skilled and unskilled, women and youth, in two of the most highly trustified industries in the United States. Furthermore, we had succeeded in directing these movements into elementary industrial channels, and the whole job had been done in the face of the crassest incompetence, indifference, and downright sabotage of the AFL leadership. The second special lesson re-emphasized for us in meatpacking and steel was that we had to have a left-wing group, an organized militant minority. The loose united front we had made with the progressive elements, while correct in principle, was not enough. In both campaigns, the lack of a strong left-wing organization had been a disastrous handicap to us, with the official union machinery as it was, in the hands of the reactionary top union leadership. In the packing industry, we had suffered severely for want of an organized left-wing movement behind us. In the steel campaign, with a crew of about 150 organizers under our leadership, about half of whom were socialists, progressives, and farmer laborites and other union militants, and including such old SL of NA fighters as Joe Manley and Sam Hammersmark, we were not so badly off as in meatpacking. It was this instrument of rank and file control that had enabled us to defy the deadly demand of Wilson and Gompers that the steel strike be postponed, that is, liquidated. But this organization also was insufficient. Clearly, we had to build another organization. The old SL of NA and ITUEL had gone on the rocks, it is true, but maybe we would have had better success next time. With this general idea in mind, therefore, I resigned my position as BRCA organizer and secretary of the Moribund National Steel Committee in January 1920, when the strike was finished. I was determined to go back to work on the railroad and to try again, as a rank and filer, to build an organized left-wing movement in the trade unions. After spending a few months writing my steel strike book, I tried to get a railroad job, but I found that I was blacklisted at my trade in Chicago. I worked a short while on the CFL official paper, but gave this up and then found myself unemployed. In the meantime, Jack Johnstone, Joe Manley, and some other Chicago militants and myself had been preparing the way for our new left-wing trade union organization. Finally, in November 1920, we launched it, a Chicago group of a couple of dozen members, and we called it the Trade Union Educational League. Again, I was elected secretary. The Old Disease, Dual Unionism Immediately, the newly organized TUEL bumped against the same rock upon which its two predecessors, the SL of NA and the ITUEL, had been wrecked. The dual union attitude held generally by revolutionary elements. This seemed as strong as ever. During the packing house and steel campaigns, the dual union illusion had been a great handicap to us. We simply could not induce the left-wing militants, of whom there were large numbers among the great masses of Polish, Russian, Lithuanian, and other immigrant workers, to participate aggressively in the two big organization campaigns. In the packing industry, Jack Johnstone had spoken before left SP groups and fairly begged them to help him fight the lane reactionary leadership. But in vain, the AFL was simply poison to them and they would have none of it. In the steel campaign, the situation was about the same. The dualist SP left wing, out of which the Communist Party was then being born, assumed, except in one or two places, an indifferent and very unsympathetic attitude to our movement, while the IWW and the SLP denounced it in the sharpest terms. An example of the strength of dual union sentiments at the time was a clash we had with Eugene V. Debs in Youngstown. In 1919, in this great steel center, where the AFL had been badly discredited recently by betrayed strikes, we were having a desperately hard time to get the workers organized. 
Debs, then just on the eve of going to jail for his Canton anti-war speech, was holding big meetings there and sharply assailing our movement with typical dualist arguments. This increased our difficulties and incensed our organizers, and I was made one of a committee of three to visit Debs to demand that he cease his attacks on pain of our making an open fight against him. Finally, he agreed to do this, but we could not induce him to tell the masses of steel workers who packed his meetings to join the AF of L unions. Later on, however, when the big strike took place, Debs heartily endorsed it and sent me word from Atlanta Penitentiary that if he were free, he would be fighting shoulder to shoulder with us to win the strike. By 1920, the IWW, the traditional hope of dual unionists, had heavily declined after its wartime spurt and had degenerated pretty much into a defense organization for its many political prisoners. But the dual union sentiment, nevertheless, fed upon a number of other independent industrial unions, all either very weak and some altogether fruitless, including the amalgamated food workers, United Labor Council, etc. The main one of such unions was the One Big Union of Canada, which exerted considerable influence in the United States. After the turn of the century, Canadian rebels had not been so badly afflicted by dualism as the American left wing, and over a period of years they had won control of the whole union in the West, and were rapidly securing influence in the entire Canadian trade union movement. But the dual union illusion finally caught up with them, and their promising situation was wrecked by the launching of the ill-fated One Big Union in Calgary on March 13, 1919. The OBU, by pulling the militants out of the old unions, as usual, left the reactionaries in complete control. Despite its long-continued lack of success, the dual union theory, however, still continued to exert a hypnotic effect over almost the whole American left wing. The IWW, fanatically dualist, would not even discuss the question of working within trade unions, nor would the SLP, nor what remained of a left wing in the SP after the 1919 split. The nascent communist movement, just born out of the SP in the shape of two communist parties, was similarly dualist and endorsed the IWW. Even liberals and progressives, in the trade unions and outside, were also dead sure that nothing could be done in the old trade unions. I remember how, at a meeting of such liberal elements in New York in 1920, after my speech on the Steel Campaign, they scoffed at my proposals that revolutionists should give up their foolish policy of building dual unions and should concentrate upon work within the conservative trade unions. 1936. That's the end of chapter 5. Thank you everyone for listening to the Workers' Reading Room. Have a good day.